For the next part of our uh, war today, I would like to hand over to Anthony Curry here, who is Associate Editor at Reuters Breaking Views. He will be guiding you through a special segment that's dedicated to building business water resilience in uncertain times. Um, this session is uh, coordinated by UN Global Compact, CEO Water Mandate, and CDP. Anthony, over to you. Great, thank you, Maggie, uh, and thanks uh, for inviting me to take part in this. It's it's an honour. I apologise for what I think is a bit of an echo. We have just moved uh, to Melbourne, and not everything is quite as it should be. So it's a bit of an echo in the in the study here. Uh, but anyway, uh, since I'm in Melbourne, I can welcome you from tomorrow. It's two o'clock in the morning here. And if you take nothing else away from my introduction, let it be that I'm so passionate about playing a part in shedding more light on the global water crisis that I'll stay up at all hours to do so. Now, for those who don't know me, I'm one of the editors for Breaking Views, which is the financial commentary unit for Reuters. Uh, we're known for writing, as we like to think of it, insightful takes on the financial news of the day, be that Wall Street earnings, big corporate mergers, or the financial and economic consequences of, say, the US election last week. In other words, water might not really seem to be our beat, but as we discovered with our first major piece on the economic and financial issues of water around seven years ago now, our readers are very interested. And just to be clear, those readers are generally senior bankers, investment bankers, institutional investors, hedge funds, corporate CEOs and CFOs and the like. And they generally love reading about the deals they do, how good their results are, and whether their rivals are beating or trailing them. Yet that first piece was one of the 10 most read stories of the month back then, out of about 250, 300 pieces. So its success surprised us a bit, but it also helped spawn not just regular Breaking Views coverage of water issues, but also our overall climate coverage just in case you were looking for a media data point on the interrelationship of climate and water. Now, for all the interest, though, that I've, I've got from our readership base over the years, and of course those outside of it, I do speak a lot to, uh, to SUI and to CDP and others, it still amazes me, and yes, depresses me, how little attention big companies and investors pay to water issues, both the risks and the opportunities. Even as worsening aridification in cities from Chennai to Cape Town to Sao Paulo hit the news, and even as allegedly perennially rain-stricken countries like where I'm from in the UK, ponder whether to spend billions of pounds to pipe water from the north of the country to the south as climate change hits. And here's just one case in point of how I'm, I'm surprised at how little companies and investors look at it. Last year, I mapped the ups and downs of the seven US states negotiating over the much reduced water flowing along the Colorado River over the previous two years, just at the same time uh, as uh, we were talking about a lot of other issues with, with water in other countries. Yet the share prices of the companies, either based in the watershed or with large operations along it, there was no correlation whatsoever with the negotiations that were happening with them. And up, down, look bad, ugly, indifferent. No one seemed to care, even for a company like weapons maker Raytheon that had told CDP that 10% or more of its revenue could be at risk if the water scarcity in the basin continued or worsened. I then looked further afield and found that no investors in public at least even raised the issue with Raytheon over the previous two or three years. So what this told me, and yes, I think things have changed a bit over the past year, year and a half with various other issues, not least COVID, not least uh, uh, the various fires that have been happening in California, in Brazil, in Australia, uh, that this has pushed some of these issues even further to the fore. But it's clear to me that we need to push companies and financiers to turn what may often, too often, be just academic interest in the topic into action. Now, I'm a journalist, so almost by nature, I have to be sceptical. But it's a relief to see water elevated to such a prominent role at COP26 and to see outfits like the CEO of Water Mandate and others find new ways to try and tackle the problems. Now, our panel for this session, which we'll get to in a few minutes, will delve into some of these issues from a business and financial perspective in detail. But first, I'd like to hand over to Jason Morrison, head of the CEO of Water Mandate and president of the Pacific Institute for his opening remarks. Over to you, Jason. Thanks, Anthony. Um... And thanks for the heroic effort uh, shepherding our discussion today in the middle of the night. Uh, I um, am just beginning my work day here on the West Coast uh, of the US and I can't claim to have stayed up through the night seeing the previous sessions. Um, but if I could get my slides up um, and before I get into my slides, I, I just wanna start with a, a top line message that may have been brought to the fore in the previous sessions. And I look forward to seeing the recordings uh, and to seeing how this was, uh, was, was articulated in prior sessions. But 
When it comes to the issue of the opportunity and imperative for the business sector for action on water and climate, I think a top message is that on the climate adaptation side of the equation, the notion that water resilience is a key strategy uh, that companies must pursue in order to uh, alleviate and mitigate water related risk is well understood. Water stewardship practice for a decade now has really been driven by the sense of risk uh, and water resilience being a response. Uh, I will say um, that many companies that are taking this approach are probably not yet fully aware of the depth and extent of their risk as we face climate change and weirdification of the weather. But that whole notion that resiliency needs to be uh, front and center is there. On the climate mitigation side, I put that where opportunity uh, resides for water, but not necessarily well understood yet. There are some companies that are leading in this area uh, and beginning to, to understand the potential uh, for water also to serve uh, a, 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 and have benefit around climate mitigation, but we're still early days. So those are some of my top line messages. If I can get the next slide, please. Let me, let me go through some of the ideas as I tee up and set the stage for the panel discussion uh, that Anthony will shepherd. So for those not familiar with the CO water mandate, it is a corporate water stewardship commitment platform uh, that is uh, co-managed between the Pacific Institute and the UN Global Compact. It was launched by the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in 2007 uh, and, to, uh, uh, and today have roughly 180 companies from a wide range of industry sectors uh, and headquartered in um, regions around the world. And companies that uh, endorse the seal water mandate uh, commit to taking action in these six areas that you see along the bottom of the screen and to reporting progress annually against those commitments. We have an agreement with CDP such that any company that makes the uh, water questionnaire or the water survey uh, of CDPs automatically uh, suffices for their annual reporting requirement under the sea water mandate. So next slide, please. When, um, when people talk about uh, the global water crisis, what are, what are they talking about? And just really quickly wanna give the top line contours of, of what this is about. Uh, oftentimes it's having too little water, uh, sometimes it's too much water. That can happen in the same location in the same year. Uh, we also have a long standing trend toward degradation in water quality due to uh, human pollution. There's a social equity dimension to water uh, and the fact that uh, hundreds of millions of people still do not have access to clean water or safely managed uh, sanitation services. Uh, when it comes to the global pandemic, we still have over 3 billion people that don't have access to hand washing facilities in their homes. We also have dewatered uh, uh, natural systems. Um, they're under uh, uh, incredible pressure globally, uh, and this has had impacts on their functioning, but also uh, the degree to which uh, they can manage um, storm events, and I'll come back to that later. Uh, and then lastly, this issue of either aging uh, infrastructure, infrastructure that was built without climate change in mind and is not satisfactory to uh, deal with today's uh, uh, storm events. Uh, and then also in the global south, uh, an infrastructure that's yet to be built. I've also been interested in how many times uh, during the course of this day, people have used uh, the uh, analogy that uh, if climate change were the shark, uh, water would be its teeth. And that's, uh, it's very poignant because it speaks to how the real bite of climate change happens uh, through water. Uh, if you look at natural disasters, nine and 10 are water related. And if you look well out into the future, there's estimates that global flood damage will cost uh, upwards of a trillion a year will have 5 billion people who will lack sufficient uh, water at least one month out of the year. And this is all due to changes in precipitation, more extreme wets, drier, uh, longer dries. But you don't have to look to 2050 to see the impacts uh, on companies. Uh, it, these uh, impacts related to climate change and water are happening today uh, around the world in different ways. Just a number of examples here, just to see, you can see the breadth and depth of it. Going back a few years now in Thailand, the, the major flooding there had huge disruption on global supply chains. Ford Motor Company alone lost uh, 34,000 vehicles due to the flooding in Thailand. 
uh, in 2019 in Brazil, low rainfall year uh, reduced production of soy by 30% had uh, impacts on global reserves of soy. Uh, Ghana, like many other parts of the world that has hydroelectric reliant uh, uh, power source is, uh, has faced outages when uh, during prolonged dry periods, which has economic ripple effects through the country. Uh, and then in California, where I reside in 2017, uh, changes in weather patterns stemming from a five-year drought that put tr pressure on uh, forests uh, and um, making them susceptible to uh, beetles, uh, beetle infestation and die-offs, then subsequently uh, led to extreme fire damage that uh, had uh, such implications that one of the largest energy producers in the world uh, declared bankruptcy in 2017. So just a few examples of how this issue is already playing out uh, at the nexus of water and climate. Earlier this year, uh, the organizations logoed here tried to look at what companies are doing to address issues at the water uh, and climate nexus. Uh, and the, the findings are somewhat striking. Uh, first of all, uh, it, it speaks to the need for companies to uh, rapidly begin to implement water resiliency measures because many companies are still only thinking about risk in their direct operations. Uh, there is nowhere near the amount of action at the scale and urgency that's needed. We think that is due to the lack of structured approaches. Companies are very much going it alone at this point and trying to figure it out, um, but the, the scaling of action will require better structures uh, and approaches. I'll come back to that later. Uh, but that building more resilient water systems is going to require dramatic improvements in uh, water efficiency and pollution reduction measures, uh, investments in catchments, uh, and building a uh, local adaptive capacity of governments. But I think the business community, if it was honest with itself, and I think this would probably be true for other segments of society, if we look uh, deeply, we'll know that we really don't have integrated approaches to tackling water and carbon right now. We're, we are somewhat siloed. Even the leading companies in the water stewardship space have had their climate programs and their GHG commitments, reduction commitments, and then they've had their water stewardship programs. And we're only now beginning uh, to take approaches that are fully integrated, uh, and that's the road ahead. But let me talk about a couple of examples here that I think show some promise. And you can click through one more click on the animation here. So um, one area, and I'm sure it's been talked about today, I've seen the agenda, is around investments in nature-based solutions. Uh, and uh, a number of companies now have been uh, investing in uh, basin health initiatives uh, through, and you can click a few times here until you fill the screen uh, across these areas. They've been investing in basins due to uh, a commitment around um, what may be called replenish or balancing, which is the notion of uh, thinking about the volumetric or consumptive use of the company in the basin, and then investing in the watershed uh, in, a, in a corollary amount in order to uh, reduce the impact on that region. We have companies like Dow that for a long, uh, many years now have invested in green infrastructure uh, as a pollution uh, control technology and found that that was so uh, cost effective that they've now committed to 1 billion investments over the next decade in green infrastructure solutions. Uh, we have companies that have been investing in uh, mangrove restoration and other uh, uh, ecosystem uh, restoration strategies as a result of their commitments on water. And more recently uh, in the food uh, sector, uh, leading companies like Danone and others have really tried to build uh, soil health through their programs with their supply chain partners through the lens of regenerative agriculture. And all of these investments have some greenhouse gas or carbon capture uh, benefit. Uh, but the problem here is that we don't have agreed upon methodologies to simultaneously capture the stack benefits across how these investments in nature have both water and, uh, and uh, climate or carbon benefits. And we are working right now with Danone and the Nature Conservancy uh, and other organizations uh, to try to quantify uh, these, um, these benefits. 
there's also this move uh, toward circularity or circular water management. I'm just gonna talk about two examples here and I'll start on the right-hand side uh, and move to the left. Uh, and on the right-hand side, uh, I'm, I'm not sure there's some text here that seems to be missing, but is uh, a water reuse uh, uh, program in uh, the Sao Paulo area. It's the largest uh, water, uh, there we go, uh, lot of water reuse uh, project in Latin America called Aquapolo. Uh, it's uh, a partnership uh, between uh, the sanitation uh, 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 district in, in Sao Paulo, uh, BRK Ambiental, and the petrochemical company uh, Broschem. And uh, it, the, the project here uh, allows for co-location and use of uh, treated wastewater for industrial purposes. I believe uh, Broschem is using about two thirds uh, of this uh, supply, uh, the, the size of this project uh, annually is enough water for 33,000 uh, residents in the Sao, Sao Paulo area. Um, but importantly around uh, this project to think about is during the 2015 drought, uh, when there was a disruption in water supply, Bruskem uh, was not uh, forced to scale back production uh, at its facilities, which had a cost savings of uh, 200 million reais, uh, reais, which is roughly 37 million US dollars uh, in, uh, in savings uh, as a result of not having to scale back production. On the left-hand side here is an example of some investments that are happening in, the, in California, in the Silicon Valley. Um, this is the strategies uh, around uh, distributed approaches or uh, decentralized approaches, it's also called uh, here you have two examples, one uh, Microsoft, which has a net zero water campus there. And the, the lower picture is uh, the investments being made by Google uh, around uh, reuse, on-site reuse and, um, and uh, stormwater capture. Uh, and these uh, decentralized strategies uh, build resilience for the company itself, but also have broader uh, resiliency benefits for the region. Uh, the Silicon Valley does rely on imported supply uh, and the degree to which these companies are investing in this on-site reuse uh, and stormwater capture has community benefits as such as reduced flooding, um, uh, reduced heat island effect, uh, open green space for the community, um, but it also uh, allows for um, the municipality to uh, lessen its dependence on imported supply. And this project right now here is about trying to understand in the Silicon Valley, uh, what is the potential for scaling these decentralized approaches and how to optimize the location of them such that they marry with the pipe system of water supply and wastewater treatment in the region and make sure that that decentralized investment happens in the places that best complement the deficiencies in the pipe system. Next slide, please. And then um, lastly, I'd like to talk about an initiative that the Sea Water Mandate launched this year. And it's, uh, uh, it's one that we're quite uh, excited about uh, called the Water Resilience Coalition. And this perhaps is most in line with what some of the conversation of today has been around uh, race to zero. And that is around having um, ambitious long-term uh, enterprise level commitments uh, coupled with strategies of how companies can work with others to uh, implement. So if you could, uh, uh, maybe click three times and get these three text boxes in. I'm mostly going to focus on the first element of this strategy, which is the notion of net positive water impact. And what Water Resilience Coalition members are committing to here is to have a net positive water impact in the water stress basins where the, the member or the company has operations. And when we talk about the dimensions of stress here, we have three important uh, pillars of water stress to think about. The water quantity piece or water availability, the water quality piece, and then the accessibility piece, the degree to which uh, communities have access to water and sanitation. And so the notion of having net positive water impact in this area is to invest in ways that um, alleviate stress in all three components of these uh, where the company has operations. And the way to get there is through a combination of investing on in-site operational efficiencies and pollution reductions, coupled with investment in basin initiatives with partners uh, who are uh, gonna try to address these different dimensions of stress. Next slide, please. And the Global Compact is, uh, has a really strong conviction that uh, we can lead the way in creating a more water resilient future by 2050. And, a, and an analysis that uh, McKenzie has done uh, for the Global Compact shows that if you look at just 
the 150 largest water using members of the UN Global Compact, it would account for one third of global annual water withdrawals uh, that you could be addressing. So a huge potential for impact. Uh, and then some of you may be familiar with uh, an initiative that was launched by the Global Compact around raising the ambition uh, on uh, the, the various goals uh, that are not on track for being achieved under the SDGs, water being one of the 10. Uh, and you'll see here that the notion of net positive water uh, impact in water stress basins is the cornerstone of how companies that are interested in elevating its ambition on water and to do so in a way that can help achieve uh, uh, the SDG six goal can do so through uh, commitments uh, in this domain. Last slide here. And the reason that we're also excited about this is that we see it as a corollary to the ambition loop that will be talked about later in this session as it pertains to climate. And here's how uh, you can think about it. So the Water Resilience Coalition pledge directly advances four of the six targets of SDG six, the two on wash, the water access and sanitation, the one on water quality and the one on water quantity through availability, uh, sustainable withdrawals and efficiency. The structural approach to the WRC to working collectively in basins of shared interest will also address uh, the uh, water governance, uh, IWRM uh, target, and also the investments in basins uh, around water uh, nature-based solutions will address the SDG 6.6 target. So we see this long-term commitment that the business community is taking uh, on water uh, through the WRC is aligning with their public sector counterparts who have also made long-term commitments on achievement of SDG 6. And we think this architecture has a really powerful way of reinforcing the commitments that uh, companies have on water in a way that aligns with their public sector counterparts. Thank you. And uh, I look forward to seeing where the conversation heads. Back over to you, Anthony. Great, uh, thank you, Jason. And um, I must confess I haven't today, but I have in the past used the uh, water sharks and teeth analogy. And actually just thinking about the point you're making about natural capital, we wrote a piece last year, uh, since we're talking about financial investments here, where we basically ascertained if you look at the top 100 emitters of greenhouse gases, uh, and you look at their returns. It turns out that, that okay, there's some big ifs in this, but if you were to invest your money as one of those big emitters into sustainable forestry, uh, then the majority of them would probably earn a better return from sustainable forestry than they would from their core businesses. Uh, so there's an even, even, even more reason for them to get involved in this than, uh, than they might think just from a, uh, a nice branding perspective and, and, and helping out the environment. Now, before I introduce our panel, a quick update. Unfortunately, we had to postpone uh, the fireside chats scheduled for the second part of the session because uh, the fallout from America's presidential election last week meant that uh, uh, President Brad Smith of Microsoft uh, is rather taken up with, uh, with uh, what was going on there, not least from the climate and energy perspective. On the positive side, though, we do get to hear a lot more from our own panelists, uh, who are, if I may introduce them, in order of, I think, their, their speaking in a few moments. We have the CEO and Executive Director of the UN Global Compact, Sandra Ojiambo, who started just a few months ago. Um, Emilio Tenuta, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer of Ecolamp. Uh, Karina smith Ihanacho, who is the Chief Governance and Compliance Officer with Norbiz Bank Investment Management, one of the largest asset managers in the world. And then uh, a late entrant, thank you so much for joining us. We have Faraz Kaur, who is Group Head of Sustainability at Woolworth Holdings. And for those of you in the UK who think, hang on, Woolworth, I've heard that name, not, uh, but not for a long time. It's not the same as the Woolworths we grew up with. It's also not quite the same as the Woolworths I've got to know since arriving in Australia. This one uh, is the South African company, just to avoid any confusion whatsoever. Now, what I want to do, we've got each of our um, panelists is going to uh, take a few minutes for some opening remarks, then we'll dive into questions. Uh, Sander, I'd like to pass the floor over to you, please, uh, for your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, first for the warm welcome, and indeed actually both to Anthony and Jason for the insights and, and really setting the tone for the discussion that we're about to have. I must say, since we did talk a little bit about Feroz, Feroz and I, I think have known each other for a couple of years, so great to see him again uh, representing Woolworth South Africa. So to you all, you know, first greetings from a slightly grey and rainy New York. Um, it's great to be with you all and thank you for all the audience and participate, participants who are also here with us today. 
Um, I think Anthony and Jason have set the tone. Um, the issues at hand could not be more important. Here at the UN Global Compact, for us, um, you know, we work to promote responsible business practices, very much including business action on water and climate, and indeed all of the sustainable development goals. And actually at the heart of it, water is very interlinked. I can't think of many of the goals that, that don't have a, a water focus or a water imperative within them. Within them. We have about 11,000 participating companies, and all of these have made a commitment to support our 10 principles, which span human rights, labor, the environment, and anti-corruption. But also more importantly, we need these 10 principles in play to ensure a win in the most important race of our time, the race to zero, as in net zero emissions by 2050. There's no time to waste. I think we do need to take the water mandate and climate action to the next level, working through circularity, aiming for scale, aiming for impact, and driving forward those ambition loops, as, as Jason highlighted, which, uh, you know, which bring together private sector leadership and bold government policies to reinforce each other and stretch our ambitions. To drumstart this, in, this transformation in the private sector, the UN Global Compact has launched two key initiatives this year. One, the business ambition for 1.5 degrees, which aims to mobilize companies to show their leadership by setting and committing to science-based targets to cut down the initiatives, and then, sorry, to cut down their emissions. And then there's the other, the SDG Ambition Initiative, which aims to accelerate business ambition and action on achieving the global goals by 2030. Of course, water is central to this as well. This campaign calls for businesses to set meaningful, measurable benchmarks for integrating sustainability into all their operations, including benchmarks for water resilience. And now our CEO Water Mandate and its newly launched Water Resilience Coalition are raising the bar yet again. Companies that join the coalition are pledging to help lead the way towards achieving water-related sustainable development goals. These companies are tackling the global water crisis that climate change has certainly intensified. They're working towards identifying climate positive solutions to the crisis, focusing on water resilience both internally and across their value chains. I think this was highlighted much earlier. To have impact, you can't only look at your internal footprint, you truly need to look at your supply chain, your value chain, and links to the overall broader business ecosystem. So these companies will also work to improve the watersheds where they have operations. We firmly believe that businesses taking collective action through campaigns like Water is Resilient and the recently initiated water aid response to the COVID-19 pandemic are truly the forward-looking paths that will allow us to gain much success and much impact. So let me just close my, my brief introductory comments by saying, by redoubling its own ambition and reinforcing positive action by government, we believe that the private sector can and must play a central role in advancing water resilience. I truly look forward to our discussion, the questions about what the most impactful, meaningful, and relevant way to do this would be. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Sandra. And just so you know, I keep turning my, my uh, camera off because I realize there's a huge uh, shadow from the light above me. Um, Emilio uh, from Ecolab, over to you. Good to see you again, it's been a while. Good to see you as well. Uh, thanks for, for having me today and greetings from St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, it's good to be with, uh, with my fellow panelists and, and you, Anthony. Um, let me start with a brief overview of Ecolab for folks that you know, may not know us, Ecolab, is the global leader in water hygiene and infection prevention solutions and services for industry and, and institutional markets. We employ about 45,000 people and we are active in more than 170 countries serving more than 3 million locations around the world. So part of the, our solution is, is that we serve virtually every industry from huge cooling systems, have power stations to auto assembly plants, uh, to, to the dish machines and cleaning products that you use in your neighborhood restaurants, which obviously are being impacted because of the health crisis. We help advance food safety. We maintain clean and safe environments and optimize water and energy use and improve operational efficiency, which is obviously very critical today uh, during the economic crisis. So sustainability is core to what we do. And I wanna build on uh, Anthony and Jason's opening context setting by giving you a brief overview of how we at Ecolab see water solutions directly contributing to 
uh, building water and climate resilience. Clearly today and tomorrow's challenges are interconnected. We, we see that, clear, you know, all of us today. And our world is facing several present day challenges, responding to the health and economic crisis, as I mentioned, um, but also the social and civil reckoning that are impacting us today. And we're well aware of the challenges that we'll face in the next decade uh, related to population growth and feeding a growing population and the, the need for more, you know, what, what is it, 40% more water, 35% more food, 25% more energy to get it done. And of course, all of that isn't enough because we're also tackling the effects of climate change. Uh, but we can't talk about climate change without talking about water to Jason's point. And that climate change really compounds these water issues leading to droughts, floods, and irregular weather, weather patterns that we've been experiencing. So as a global leader in industrial water management, we're, we're behind the scenes working alongside of our customers and seeing this firsthand, the challenges that they're experiencing. We have a unique point of view here in terms of how the role that water plays in operations for industry around the world. To put this in perspective, every year we, mo we, we manage more than a trillion gallons, and that's with a T, of water. In 2019, we helped our customers uh, save uh, 206 billion gallons, that's 206 billion gallons of water, equivalent to the drinking water needs of more than 700 million people. So water requires energy to cool, heat, um, treat it, move it, and put it to work. By reducing water use, businesses can also reduce energy consumption and very importantly, during an economic crisis, save money. We know that an integrated approach to smart water management is crucial to how we'll address the climate issues, both in our own operations and with our customers. So in July of 2020, we launched our most ambitious goals yet called our 2030 impact goals. There are two tracks associated with these goals. The impact that we can help by, by helping 3 million customer locations around the world around water, climate, food, and health. For example, we have uh, on, the, on the water pillar, we have a water goal by 2030 of working with our customers to help conserve more than 300 billion gallons of water, which is equivalent to the drinking water needs of a billion people. So we're ramping up our efforts also in our second track which is our own operations. And, and you know, when you look at the goals there to reduce carbon emissions and water use, we plan to achieve our carbon emissions or to, to have our carbon emissions by 20, by half, by 2030 and net zero by 2050. We have made the commitment to the UN business ambition, 1.5 degrees Celsius pledge. And we are a founding member as Jason, uh, talked about earlier, of the Water Resilience Coalition and the Net Water Positive Pledge, further to the commitment that we plan to restore greater than 50% of our water withdrawal through nature-based solutions in our operations and certify our at-risk sites to the Alliance for Water Stewardship Standard. So most organizations, um, with all that being said, most organizations focus on the importance of developing local solutions, which is the most critical part because water is highly localized. And at the facility level to drive progress around water and climate within these watersheds is not easy. And understanding the shared water challenge of different stakeholders in that basin is not, it's not inherent to the way businesses think today. So the need for collaboration is clear. We can't make an impactful change alone in a vacuum. Businesses have the opportunity to band together to drive action. And, and this to me is at the heart of the Water Resilience Coalition that Jason spoke about earlier. So Anthony, back to you. Um, those are my opening remarks. Great, thank you, Emilio. And uh, Karina from uh, Norway's Bank Investment Management, let me call on you to come forward next, please. Yeah, thanks, Anthony, and uh, good afternoon. Now we're in London. So we are the managers of the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. We have uh, more than $1 trillion in asset under management, 
And most of that money, around 70%, is invested into listed companies around the world. So on average, we own 1.5% of all the world's listed companies. So we come very much from an investor perspective. And water has been a priority area for us since we helped start CDP Water 11 years ago. And we very much believe that the way water is managed by companies can influence their profits and hence also our uh, long-term value creation. But it can also affect the profits of other companies we invest in that are dependent on the same sources of water. And what we also see is that water has strong links to climate change. Climate change is already leading to more floods, floods and droughts and in some, in some regions. And companies need to be prepared for and mitigate a future with too much, too little or too dirty water. In addition, the current management and mismanagement of water contributes to 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So managing water well at a global level means both reducing green, greenhouse gas emission and building resilience to the negative effects of climate change. And we believe that this would support the long-term financial returns of the fund. So we don't use a lot of water ourselves. But as an investor, we can support and we can challenge the companies in our portfolio. And we have over time developed quite an ambitious set of expectations to companies on water and climate change. Firstly, we expect companies to measure and report how much water they use and to set reduction targets. We also underline the need to understand risks. For instance, through the use of scenario analysis. And this is where all the work that has been done on climate modeling comes into practical use. Climate scenarios can help companies understand whether they should uh, really be building, the, building that new factory in an area that's likely to see frequent flooding, or whether agricultural commodity prices will be significantly impacted by droughts. And we use such scenario analysis ourselves. For instance, to look at the exposure or our own real estate portfolio to coastal and river flooding and the various climate scenarios. Another area we focus on is the concept of collective river basin management. Companies share water with so many other users and finding collective solutions is important. And governments and regulators have a key role in facilitating collaboration with other stakeholders in water basins providing predictability and ensuring a level playing field. And policy can itself provide a strong framework within which the private sector can find the most cost, carbon and water efficient solutions. On the back of these solutions, policymakers can craft even more ambitious targets, creating a virtuous ambition loop. So, so far this year, we have had almost 150 interactions with companies on water management. And in most cases, we discuss climate change at the same time. And these topics are inextricably linked. We believe that companies sh should see them as such and very relevant set ambitious targets to manage both climate and water in a sustainable manner. So back to you, Anthony. Great, thank you, Karina. And uh, can I now call on you, Faroz? Thank you again for uh, joining us. Do you have some opening remarks? I do, thank you very much, Anthony. Hi. I'm not sure if you can hear me. We can hear you. Ah, brilliant, thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. Greetings from Cape Town in South Africa. Um, so by way of introduction, my name is Firo Skur. I head up sustainability for, as Anthony mentioned, um, the Woolworths Holdings Group. Um, we are a Southern Hemisphere based um, retailer. Uh, we are uh, involved in food and fashion and beauty retailing. Uh, we're based primarily in South Africa. Um, we have operations, small operations in 11 other African countries. And just to confuse things, we are also based in Australia, but not the Woolworths in Australia. 
we own other business, uh, other retail businesses in Australia. Um, we uh, we are. We have 45,000 staff across our operations. Um, uh, we have um, both um, retail stores um, as well as department stores um, in our portfolio. And we are primarily an own brand business. And why that is important for us is that because it's own brand, we, we have very strong relationships with our supply chain and uh, we are quite involved in the sourcing of, of product. Um, and places a greater um, uh, imperative on us to to, to take into account the both environmental as well as social impacts of, of, of our sourcing behavior. Um, like other companies, uh, we've recently been re-looking at our um, sustainability strategies and goals. Um, we generally have a, a discipline of, of revisiting them every five years. And uh, we, we did that uh, again this year, uh, having uh, come to the end of our, our, our previous set of five-year targets and goals. And in, and in revising and, and really looking at our processes this year, we, we, we spent a lot of time on, on an analysis globally around what are the big issues and what are the key things that we need to be focusing on and narrowing them down to, the, to those that are most material. And it would be no surprise that the most dominant um, issue um, that came out of that process was climate change. By and far, um, climate change was the, the dominant issue that as a business uh, we needed to be um, uh, taking into account um, from upstream uh, through operations downstream. We identified four others in no particular order. I think climate change was just so dominant that it, it, it automatically is number one, but two to four in no particular order. But one of those other four was water. And interestingly enough, water has always been there, but it was reaffirming the importance of water um, as, a, as a material issue. The other ones out of interest were uh, responsible sourcing, um, again, a reaffirmation of, of, of sourcing behavior. Um, and then being a retailer, we know the impact of packaging and waste globally. And then finally, biodiversity loss, uh, which we, we, we put in our top five. And we then built um, a set of principles and targets um, um, around these. In as much as there are five distinct uh, um, material issues, or we, we listen to them as five, we do believe that um, intrinsically they're all linked. Uh, and, and climate change impacts them um, in one way or the other. So the, I think for convenience, they, 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 they managed as five separate things or they listed as five separate things, but ultimately um, they, they're highly uh, interrelated. And once, we, once we, we, we settled on those material issues, we then agreed with a set of principles with the business and the leadership to say that if we're going to um, address substantively um, uh, these issues across the business, then then there's some principles that should be non-negotiable. And the first one was that whatever we're doing, the space needs to be ambitious. Uh, we, we, need to be, we, we need to be ambitious and be pushing ourselves as a business and not just the business, but our industry and our sector with us. Secondly, was that in, in, in doing uh, target setting, in as much as we were in a five-year cycle, we needed to be comfortable with setting goals in much longer time horizons. We had to be comfortable setting goals 10, 20, even 30 years out because given the nature of the kind of things we, we're dealing with, we need that level of commitment from an organization. And that's, that's something that it, I think takes some doing in an organization where they're not generally, I think five years is generally you know, long-term planning in, in many businesses. So that was a key principle that we, that we um, agreed upon. Another principle was that we should, as far as possible, be led by science or context-based target setting. Um, I think we, we, we pass the days where we, we set targets because they sound good or, or you know, it, it seems like our stakeholders think these are good targets. Um, we, 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 the, the targets need to have some basis, um, ideally in science. And then a, another principle and more a reaffirmation was that whatever we do needs to be aligned with collective action, whether it is global collective action or regional collective action or national collective action, that the nature of the the issues we're dealing with are beyond any single organization or sector to, to address. And that collective action is, is a fundamental um, element of that. And so having then agreed on, the, on the, the material issues and the principles, and there were a few other principles as well around circularity and, and, and transparency and so on, but I think the ones I spoke about were the, the key dominant principles. We then agreed on a number of goals. Um, so the, the in the climate space, and I'll just talk about those in the climate and, and water space. In the climate uh, space, we, we, we set a, 
having committed to set a science-based target uh, about four years ago, we, we set and had um, approved a science-based target of halving our emissions by 2030 uh, based on the 1.5 degree scenario. Um, in addition, we, we set a stretch target of being uh, net um, carbon zero by uh, net zero carbon by 2040. I'm not sure if that's a bit too ambitious. I know most targets are out to 2050, but we, we set ours out to 2040. And in addition, we set ourselves a target of sourcing all our energy from renewables by 2030. Now, what places additional um, complexity on this is given I mentioned where we operate. We operate primarily in South Africa and Australia, which are both highly uh, fossil fuel dependent um, economies. And so it places added emphasis on direct operations. This doesn't include um, uh, the work we do on our supply chain um, globally. And then in addition, we set a water target. And this is where the, it became a bit more complex is that we, we've been members of the CEO Water Mandate for many years. Um, and we are members of the Water Resilience Coalition as well. And I've had a number of conversations with stakeholders, including, including Jason, in the sense that we've been doing work in the water space for a number of years, again, driven by the fact that we operate in very water um, stressed regions of the world. But there's issues around um, corporate level water target setting have been quite difficult because water is quite a, a location based thing and, and, and you generally have targets set, you know, right down to site level. And so in, in our discussions, we felt that in the absence of, of of us creating a new way of setting a target, we adopted the Water Resilience Coalition target of um, net positive water impact by 2050 as our corporate level target. And we feel that it meets, and the reason we did that is because it meets a number of the principles I just uh, spoke about. It is aligned to collective action. Um, it allows us to look at our supply chain. Um, it allows us to look beyond um, a single, you know, when dealing with water is a complex, you, you're dealing with quantity or quality or availability or access and so on. And, and, and the Water Resilience Coalition target allows us potentially to, to look at, at this multifaceted um, elements in the water space. And, and it gives us the ability then to, to set a very long-term target and then define within that what we mean around net water positive, whether it is country level um, and whether it is at own operations or in, in our supply chain. And it also allows us to, to look at the work we're currently doing. And so we've got a number of initiatives in place and which have been in play for, for a long time. Um, for example, in, in the South African context where we have a very big food business and we source between 90 and 95% of our fresh produce in South and Southern Africa, which are water stressed regions. We've got a program which, we, which is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year, which we, we call Farming for the Future. But if we were to use current nomenclature, would would be known as a regenerative agriculture program, um, and it essentially boils down to working with our farmers, um, our direct farm, um, the farmers we source from, on improving their soil health. Um, the idea being, the healthier the soil, uh, the better produce we get out of it with the less inputs, and um, it's scientifically managed with by agronomists. Um, we 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 track every farm across over 200 um, you know, indicators. 116 of those indicators are related to water. Uh, we've got something called a water footprint index, which is part of that. And it all talks to healthy soil, um, uh, contributing to healthy produce, but being uh, good for the environment as well. And so we've, we've done water stewardship work um, together with the WWF and the Alliance for Water Stewardship. We work with um, uh, basin level work uh, we've been doing uh, rehabilitation of uh, water catchment areas. Um, uh, studies say that in South Africa, up to 4% of uh, uh, fresh water is taken up by alien vegetation. In a country with uh, very scarce water resources, this, this is um, it's a difficult situation. So we've been working with partners in, 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 in uh, water uh, volumes in, in, natural, um, in natural basins and so on. And then in our long supply chain, things like detox and, and so on, you know, in our, in our fashion uh, sourcing supply chains and so on. But overall, I think my, I'll end by saying that in order to make a, a, a difference in the space, I, we, we need to be working collaboratively and we need to be working at scale. And I think the only way we can do that is, is through partnerships like the CO Water Mandate, the Water Resilient Coalition and others. Thank you. Great, thank you for us. That was really fascinating. It's good to, to, to understand how you came to, to use the, um, the WRC's ideas on this as well. Um, 
We've got a few questions that we, we set up in advance and I think we put in the, in the agenda. Before we get to those, I just want to go through a couple of things that you guys have been saying. Sandra, firstly, I want to talk, put this one to you, although actually, um, Emilio, you can talk about this as well and, and others if you wish to. In fact, Jason and, um, and Karina kind of brought this up. I'm just wondering, when you discuss with your, with your clients or with your memberships, and Sandra, I'll start with you with the membership of the, the, uh, with, with the UN Global Compact, how, how much are you discovering that your um, members actually do want to talk about water or can talk about water compared to, say, talking about um, climate, greenhouse gas emissions? I mean, is it, I always get the sense there's a, there's a measurable gulf, and I think uh, others have already mentioned that. I just want to gauge what, what you're seeing, both from the, um, the Global Compact, but then also you, Emilio, since you were talking about talking to your clients a lot as well. Um, thanks. It, it's, a, it's a really good question here. And, you know, if I, I went by the statistics, I'd say probably just about 20% of the global compact companies are actively engaged in the water mandate. But, you know, the truth is, I think when you look at the interlinkages, and I think that's where it's really important, we had talked about making sure that you're not just looking at what goes on, you know, in your company, but, you know, in your value chain, in your supply chain, and the overall ecosystem. So through a much broader ecosystem approach, you know, through our climate dialogues and through other dialogues, we are focusing on water. So, you know, I think water is one of those, I said in my earlier comments, that is intricately linked to many of the SDGs. But if we're to take a razor focus on water mandate, not enough. We've definitely seen an incremental movement in terms of companies engaging more in the water mandate. I think we've doubled this over the last couple of years or so. Um, but I think, you know, what is really more important is, is, you know, how can we amplify the speed? How we can how can we continue to show the relevance, the interlinkages, the importance of of the water mandate um, and really the impact that it has on the overall climate mandate. And I think with that, so we tend to take a dual and a very holistic approach to, to the question, the discussions, but I do think there's definitely more we can do to put the singular focus on water, but I emphasize that I do think the interlinkages also provide additional platforms for, for interrogation and for addressing the issues. No, absolutely, I'd agree. I mean, Emilio, bringing you in here, I'm just thinking, a lot of your companies are thinking very specifically about site-specific water, I would think, a lot of the time. Um, you're obviously trying, uh, being a founding member of the WRC, trying to get people to think much more broadly and holistically about water, and including in bringing it into uh, climate change. How much are you seeing the clients you're talking to thinking along similar lines, or how surprised are you when they, are they when you bring these kind of conversations up, these kind of ideas up? So I would say that the, without a doubt, I think the, the point that was made earlier, about, you know, maybe 20% of the mandate uh, or, or the uh, global compact and, and, and companies for the compact are thinking about water in a way that, uh, is progressive. I would say that the large, big brands, multinationals, regionals, uh, large regionals are doing are setting targets. I think what happens, Anthony, is that we cast a wider net. And what we found is when we start to think about this it, it, at the intersection of water and climate. And the, the point being that, you know, that what is sometimes forgotten more often than not is that when you conserve water and, and drive a smart water management strategy at a local level, that saves energy. And that ultimately leads to greenhouse gas reduction that, that also addresses their climate commitments as well. And I think that's one thing that we sometimes see is, is, is missing. The other is this gap between corporate target setting and actually cascading that down to the local level where the action needs to take place. And I think some of the some of the comments that were made earlier by the panelists related to context-based setting and starting to use a at-risk watershed mindset in, ter in terms of action enables folks to resource and prioritize where they do need to take action as opposed to feeling overwhelmed and trying to take on too much. Okay, and uh, Karina, can I bring you in here as well? Because you, you did mention it as well. And also, of course, you talked about the number of companies you're engaging with, I think about 150 of them. And I think if I'm right, looking at the, the data you sent through, maybe half of those were companies you're dealing with both, talking to about both water and climate. But it's also quite a small subset, isn't it, of the what, 9,000 or so companies that NBIM is invested in. So how do you, how do you choose who you uh, talk to about these issues? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very good question. 
Um, I mean, it's, it's a small part of our portfolio, if you think 150 companies. Uh, uh, we are investing more than 9,000 companies. But uh, if you think on the other hand, by speaking with the management teams of more than 100 of the world's largest companies about water, that's, that's not bad, actually. That should not be underestimated. Um, but just to compare again, we, we have um, spoken and had interaction with companies this year on climate um, more than 500 times, so you can definitely see the difference here. Um, we, what we see really is that most companies are definitely aware of the water issue and very willing to talk to us about the, the, that. But I think the difference we see that uh, with a lot of companies, there are lots of expertise on water issues at technical level. But what we experience is that executives and board members that we talk to quite often are more comfortable with speaking about climate change. We definitely see a difference there. And whilst that has been a good step, we are very happy to see board engaging on climate issues. We truly need uh, or see a need for companies to understand you know, the interlinkages between those issues that Sada talks so well about. Um, and then a little bit on how we choose these companies. Um, you know, we choose them based on materiality. You know, where is water most relevant for the companies? Where is water most mostly a risk issue? And although we prioritize companies based on size, size and also where we have portfolio management coverage, we also, you know, look at controversies that may arise during the year. So it's sort of a mixed way of picking out the companies we engage with. Okay, and, and also just, um, sorry, let me just go back to this one. So, um, I mean, obviously you've been, you've been targeting, I think, as you mentioned earlier on, you've been targeting water issues for quite a while. You've been heavily involved with CDP for some time on, on, on getting data. How would you characterize how companies think about data on water now? Do you think they're getting a better handle on it? Do you think it's improved a lot in recent years? Do you, do you think it's still lacking? Obviously, from the conversations you're having, I suggest, I, I, I guess that it's still a bit lacking and it's uh, arguably harder to get data on water than it is on, on greenhouse gas emissions, although uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, how would you characterize how, how those conversations on data have changed over the past few years? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have measured companies' disclosure on water for almost 10 years, uh, actually. And we have definitely seen improvements over that time, but still only around 10% of companies in our portfolio reported total water consumption. And so this is actually, you know, less than a thousand companies. And for the rest, we have to sort of do our best, uh, use best efforts to calculate how much the rest use. So um, the companies that do report, though, are generally the larger companies. So in a way, they represent more than 50% of the actual water consumption. So even though it's only 10% of the companies, we do get roughly 50% of the actual consumption of water reported into us. Uh, but you know, this is only the total uh, consumption. And when it comes to water use at the basin or facility level, we see that only around 500 companies in our portfolio give such detailed data. So the, you know, the, the basic here is that there's a huge way to go. It's a huge gap to close for companies to report properly on water data. And, and we as an investor, we really need that to do a proper risk assessment. Great, thank you. And for us, I'd like to bring you in on this one. Um, if I look at the, the, the questions that we'd outlined in advance, so the first one is what kind of leadership can and should be expected from companies to create the ambition loops uh, needed for change, which I know is one of the, the, the themes of, of, of this week. Um, let me put this slightly differently to you. Um, given um, your company's um, presence in South Africa, and also, as you said, you're sourcing a lot of your uh, food from suppliers in water stress regions. How, how well have, have you done and how well have you seen companies and other institutions come together in South Africa, especially given the, 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 uh, the problems that Cape Town was going through, to try and, and come up with co collaborative solutions that, that so many people are talking about and certainly what we're talking about on this panel. Yeah, so I think, I mean, water is in South Africa, it's, it's always been an issue just given the nature of, 
of the situation, right? Um, so we 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 get half um, just half, under half the average annual global rainfall in the country. Um, we have very little surface water. We don't have any major navigable uh, rivers in in the country. Um, also, I think so. That's from an environmental perspective. Water is also not just an environmental issue. And in South Africa, we see that I think in many cases, water is often more importantly a social issue. Um, and by that, I mean, it's who has access to water and what quality of water do they have access to and how much water do they have access to and, and when do they have access to it and so on. And so water generally tends to be much more front of mind in the South African context than it might be in, in other parts of the world. So it's not necessarily a new, a new issue um, looking at water. Certainly in the, in the corporate environment, I think they're still, having said that, there's still challenges um, touching on what Karina said, you know, on water data and water management and quality of data and so on. I mean, that can be improved, but the principle of our, around water and the focus on water is, is not a new thing. Um, so having said that, there's a, lot, there's a lot going on in the sense of initiatives on the ground, whether government-led, uh, NGO-led, industry-led or, or collaboratively um, together, um, looking at addressing the various elements that I spoke about. I mean, the, the, the water that we have available is the water that we have available, but we, we also face same challenges that are faced um, all over um, elsewhere in the world. Agriculture accounts for up to 60% of um, all surface water withdrawals. Um, in addition, we have significant mining operations in South Africa, which, which use uh, lots of water. Interestingly in the, in, enough, in the last, I'd say, decade or so, a lot of the mines have realized that many of them have spun out water businesses where they realize given the amount of water they use in the operations, which historically would end up in uh, polluted um, um, uh, underground uh, shafts where they would pump it down. They're now, um, they are now um, processing the water down up to multiple level and have started water businesses um, and, and, and supplementing municipal water uh, systems and so on. So there's a lot of activity in the water space. Uh, I do think though that we, we're going to have future challenges as given the long-term scenarios of uh, uh, what climate impact is going to be in South Africa and, and just given what the natural state is, as I mentioned, of, of low surface water and, and poor rainfall, we're already seeing some of the forecasts uh, around changing water availability. So in the area that we're in, in the Western Cape, increasingly becoming drier, we already know that certain suppliers um, of fresh produce are looking to, uh, to um, have started setting up farming operations further north in the country where the scenario, the long-term scenarios are uh, wetter weather, for example. Um, and so we already see business impact of that suppliers moving. Uh, we, we have to look at our supply chains and start looking at, do we move out of sourcing in certain areas and, and, and start sourcing in others and so on. So within that broader context, there's, there's actually quite a bit going on at, um, at a collaborative level. Great, thank you. Sorry, just uh, uh, flutzing over, unmuting myself there. Um, Emilio, let me bring you in on this one as well. I mean, I, this may be just because I spent far too long, much of my career looking what investment banks have been doing. So maybe I'm just far too jaded by this. But, but as I said at the beginning, also as a journalist, I kind of have to be uh, skeptical. Um, but collaborative action by various companies is, is often, it kind of goes against the grain sometimes for, for the corporate and um, executives DNA. And as a government, from a purely governance, and I mean that within a company, I don't, I'm not talking about water governance here, but from a corporate governance perspective, can be quite messy to have multi-stakeholders involved in trying to push the envelope on something. Um, yet on the other hand, it's something we actually crucially need to happen with water. Um, you've been involved in, in pushing this for, for quite a while. You're a founding member of WRC. How do you imagine, how do you envisage tackling those challenges and, and how do you judge success? It is... Antony, absolutely a challenge. So I won't kid you about that. But I do believe that the mindset is shifting, right? I think a big component of any successful strategy is water stewardship and on the four walls of your own facilities is, is a concept that is gaining traction year by year, more, more and more by big companies and, and uh, medium-sized companies. And that'll an excellent example of that I think is um, the collaboration that has been formed in California. And, and you and I have talked about this in, in previous meetings, the California Water Action Collaborative. And, and Jason has been a very active member in, in, in QUAC, an acronym that you'll never forget, of course. Um, QUAC was founded in 2014 to focus on the critical water stress 
issues in the Santa Ana watershed in Southern California and brings together dozens of non-government organizations and agricultural producers, investors, but also global companies to address the challenges related to the state's water supply. And some of the biggest brands have come together, some of them part of the uh, WRC. And, and the, the goal is to improve local water management and drive corporate water stewardship and return water back to its natural systems. And you have a cluster of, of organizations that, that get it. It's, it's companies like Ecolab. We have two facilities in, in Southern California. Uh, you have General Mills, you have uh, PepsiCo, you have Coca-Cola, you have a number of big companies. So, so, you know, these initiatives that we're collaborating on, besides being able to share best practices, is restoring headwaters, it's building sustainable landscapes, it's um, uh, recharging aquifers. And so this will help, as we talked about earlier, about you know, uh, the climate ad adaptation and mitigation strategies that we need to take and that the state needs to, needs, needs to take to be more resilient. And so to me, Anthony, I think it has become more of a business imperative and that the impetus for the Water Resilience Coalition in this case is talked about to unite the CEOs of the world's largest, most influential companies says a lot about the shared purpose that these big companies have. And I, I know there's, I think, uh, 17 companies to date. And I know that, that we have a target to, to, to grow that by, by more than twice next year. More, so to, I think that says a lot to the fact that, yes, we still have a lot more to do. And it is against the grain of how executives think. But I think that's shifting and changing. Um, so some, some good hope, at least, uh, and to, to build on which I suppose can help build those ambition loops to point at those examples and say that this is where it's coming from. Um, Karina, let me quickly bring you in on here. Um, do you see much evidence of the, of the desire for cooperation growing among the companies you talk to about water issues? Absolutely, we do. We do. But as I said, there's still a long way to go. But what I think it's important here is that companies you know, the companies need to really understand the role of water in mitigating climate change. And again, how climate change then will affect their business critical water resources. And when the companies understand that, hopefully, you know, with collaboration, innovation, they can find maybe sustainable water and uh, hopefully better climate solutions. So again, I think this in interlinkage is it's an important point there. Great. And on the other side of that, Sandra, let me bring you back in on this and, and others, please do chip in. Um, what do we need from governments uh, on the other side of this ambition loop? What do we what do we push them for? And I think, you know, water governance in general can and often is one of the biggest issues behind uh, so-called droughts. I hate using the word drought, but I use it in various uh, places that we've seen around the world. Um, but government also has to get involved in sort of solving governance and other issues. So. What do we need to see them do? Sam, uh, let's, go, let's go with you, Sandra. Yeah, certainly. I mean, governments are a key part of, of this equation and the action and, and the partnerships needed, as has been alluded to earlier. I mean, first, as, as just policy setters, what are, what are the, the, what's the framework within which we're going to execute this, this water governance? I think it's really important. And we'll all recall, of course, when the sustainable development goals are created, you know, governments were at the table as well. So there should be cognizance, importance, and resources put towards addressing the overall water mandate. So for me, policy setting is one. Secondly, I think they, they can signal or create the environment that can shift or drive investment towards uh, you know, the water mandate and water priorities. I think that's another very important role that the governments can play. Um, and then thirdly, I think just overall shifting, you know, how partnerships are leveraged, that scale and impact that we seek to get uh, you know, we can certainly get it through a, a lot of private sector initiative, but I don't think we'll get to the level where we're fully addressing, as we've seen, you know, a couple of countries where, you know, water resilience and water stress is, and it's a, it's a national issue. It's, it's getting a crisis level. I think you do need government at the center to be able to drive and facilitate this conversation. So for me, it's, you know, it's, it's setting policy, it's signaling where investments should go, and I think bringing urgency to where there is really a need for critical response, um, 
you know, going forward. I think for me, those are the three key things I'd say for government. And uh, look, we're running out of time here, which how, how lucky in some respects that, that we, we didn't have the second part of the panel. So let's get on to question three. Um, in some respects, we're sort of asking, asking you to, to go against the grain here as well. What, what is the one critical level of change, if there is one, that must be activated for us to achieve our race to zero? Um, Feroz, let me start with you. Is, I mean, we've mentioned a fair number of things already. I think collaboration is probably one of the main ones for people. But is there anything else you would say if there's one big lever you can think of? Um, that would that you would like to see more work done on, and it of course won't be the only lever. But let's 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 go with what you think. Like the one of the big ones. Yeah, you know, at the risk of repeating myself, I think it would be collaboration. I just think we're dealing with 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 issues that are so fundamentally large and important um, globally that unless we've got some kind of collaboration and some kind of common purpose here, um, we yeah. we're not we're not going to make any um, significant uh, impact. Uh, Karina, thoughts from you? Yeah, I mean, I agree. Collaboration is very important. That is probably not one thing because then it maybe would have been sold already. But if I can mention another important thing is to for companies to really understand their water usage and key water data from their uh, operation and business and, and their water risk. And not only understand it, but also report on it to their investors and other stakeholders. Because by, by getting you know, real data, good data, detailed, disaggregated data, then we can really understand the risk and then investors can also take the right decisions. Emilio, over to you on this one. Yeah, so Anthony, I, won't, I, I agree with my the, the previous points. I would just add that during the pandemic, the one thing that I would say is that water, water risks and stress hasn't gone away clearly, right? And that, all three challenges that we talked about, availability, quality, and accessibility are major issues. But of course, during the pandemic, the realization that public health and water and climate change are, couldn't be more relevant to, to all of us. Um, and that being healthy aids resilience and that climate impacts water and health risks and that poor water quality is a threat to health. And then ultimately that water enables health through good hygiene. And so companies are stepping up in a big way to make commitments related to water access. And I, I think that's a, an area like Equilab has made commitments around uh, with water.org that will enable access to sustainable drinking water and improved sanitation for 100,000 people in India. You're gonna see more of that from organizations. And I think that's an area that we need to continue to focus on. Great, thank you. And Sandra, last word to you on this. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, the one lever to solve it all? Well, since I'm sure partnerships is a synonym for collaboration, let me go for something else. <laughs> and I'm gonna talk about financing. I think, you know, we, we need to be able to get sustainable financing to address some of the challenges that we need to look at in water resilience. So I think the signaling around what the long-term investment is needed getting you know either private sector uh, because I know private sector is is obviously engaged in the water mandate but looking at private sector financing to mobilize uh, resources for this and have that supplement uh, government funding and government financing as well. Great, thank you. Look, we've got to close it there. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions, uh, people in the audience. Um, just let you know, um, you are invited to come back for the closing session, which begins at. 5 p.m. GMT, 6 p.m. Central European time, uh, which I believe is 4 a.m. my time, so I might not make it. Um, and uh, just in case, Jason, are you coming in for any last minute uh, comments or shall we, uh, shall we close it? Yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm planning to do some closing remarks to synthesize some of what we've heard. Um, and thanks, uh, Anthony, for, for uh, working through the topics with our panelists today. It's, it's been fascinating and I really do wish we had another 20 minutes to respond to some of the questions that we received in the chat function because they're terrific. Um, so my take away from this conversation today was uh, the essential uh, nature of collaboration, partnerships uh, and, uh, and collective action on water. Uh, and I would like to um, do my re remarks in a way that uh, that builds up to how we at the at the Sea Water Mandate have been thinking of the promise and potential of the WRC because of the way that it can deal 
with the issue of collective action. But I wanna do so by answering the question you asked, Anthony, of why aren't there more companies along on this? Why are the le leaders outpacing? And I wanna go back in time to the beginning of the Seal Water Mandate and just speak to the evolution, even for the leaders, and the fact that the changing circumstances have made other companies also now interested in water due to what they're facing in their businesses across their value chain. When we launched in 2007, some of the first debates that we had within the membership of the, the, the seal water mandate was around uh, why are we only thinking about water as it relates to direct operations? Because for many companies, the biggest risk and impact relating to water was their indirect water use through their value chain. That's where the conversation was 13 years ago. And if you look at CDP reporting even seven or eight or nine years ago, the leading companies would put in place corporate goals around more or less enterprise level water reduction and efficiency goals. It was annual withdrawals reductions by 3% cubic meters. That, that, those data are what many companies, even the leaders were starting to think about and, uh, and, and collect uh, uh, data on and report uh, and set goals around. The big leap now toward net water positive impact is this idea of it's not a just about absolute water volumes. It's about multiple dimensions of water quality and uh, and quantity and accessibility, a key aspect of water in, in the regions where these companies operate, but that you need to take an approach that allows the company to tailor prize tailor. Uh, and prioritize the issues based on local in, uh, context and to do so in a way that allows for companies to um, allow the C-suite to have a long-term amb ambition that they can understand. And I think one of the things that's hampered the, um, the water uh, stewardship community is we've insisted on the technical comp complexity of water in a way that most CEOs cannot understand. And this very clean concept of a long-term ambition around net water positive impact, net positive water impact is something that leadership at companies can understand. And that allows for all of that tailoring and local application as Faraz mentioned to, um, to whatever that local context are. But the beauty about having a shared ambition such as net positive water impact is that these companies now have a shared purpose in regions where they have uh, over, uh, overlapping interests. And so now the potential to open the door for these companies to work together in those water stressed regions is allowing us to do the collective action work. And the fact that the, the commitment itself ladders and tailors to SDG 6 also opens the door for public private collaboration that, that can be advancing water in those areas because it, it's, it's connected to and aligns with SDG 6. So the structure of it is set up to open the door for collective action in these regions and to tailor that action to what those key issues are in that region. And I think that's the big step forward evolutionarily for the, uh, for the water stewardship space as a whole and for the work that the seal water mandate is gonna be doing specifically. So, um, that's my uh, final synthesis. And I just want to wrap us up before, uh, before uh, we adjourn to, to say, first of all, thank you, uh, Anthony, for uh, joining us and, and shepherding this conversation today um, in the wee hours. I, I can't believe you're not going to stay up until four for the closing plenary remarks. But um, I may do yet. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how long it takes for the coffee to wear off. I uh, also want to very much uh, thank uh, our co-organizers, Agua and CDP, and, and particularly Siwi, who's done a lot of the lift on this, and IUCN. It's been phenomenal working with uh, the, uh, these four uh, partners and uh, look forward to continuing the collaboration uh, as we move into 2021 as well. Um, and again, um, the closing plenary, as I understand, uh, will start in 35 minutes. I hope people will be able to join that session as well. For those that are interested in learning more about the WRC, uh, on uh, the homepage uh, of the uh, Water Resilience Coalition is a short three minute uh, video that describes what the consortium is up to. Uh, that's at the, uh, at the Seal Water Mandate's website at sealwatermandate.org forward slash resilience. Uh, and very much welcome and encourage any of the businesses that are on today's session to uh, be in touch with us and to learn more about the initiative and how you can engage. So thank you very much to everybody for taking time out of your days to join this session. And hopefully we'll uh, be able to work with you uh, as we move into next year.